All right, would you stand with me now if you're here in the building and turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. We've been, this is the third sermon that I am preaching from Peter's letter, uh, first letter, and today we'll begin our reading in chapter 2 in verse 11. <clears throat> Peter says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Just a note, by the way, I'm reading from the NIV because in this case, the NIV says it a little bit more succinctly, so usually we use the ESV, but I wanted to let you know in case you're looking at your ESV and saying, well, what's he, where's that from? Okay. All right, skip over then from um, there to chapter 3 and verse 15, and we'll be reading the second part of, we'll be beginning in the second part of verse 15. Where Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. And then down to chapter 4 and verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. And you can be seated. As you are well aware, if you've been with us, either here in the building or online over the last couple of months, we have been working through a series um, related to questions about the last days that uh, uh, we've entitled, Be Prepared. And one of the things that we have noticed in this study as we've worked our way through a number of different passages related to the last days is that Christians through the ages, as they have observed the things happening around them, have wondered whether we are living in the last days. And those are questions that people have been kind of directing my way as the pastor. Do you think we're in the last days? And there's a lot of talk about that. There's been a lot of talk about that since the beginning, <laughs> which is interesting. And we've noticed that, in fact, there's more evidence of that today in the passages that we read where Peter says uh, to his readers, the end of all things is near. So from those early days until now, Christians have observed and wondered, are these the last days? One of the reasons why that has been the case is that the signs that Jesus gives in Matthew 24, and we looked at those at, at Matthew 24, spent several weeks there looking at the various signs and the things that Jesus says. The signs that Jesus gives there aren't confined to a brief period just before his return. In fact, the spirit of Antichrist has been active through the ages. And Jesus talks about the Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist. And we can look back through history and we can see that spirit at work. Sometimes it wells up and other times it's less pronounced. And yet it is at work. So one of the things that I've been trying to stress um, through this series of messages based on that is that it's incumbent on us not just to be prepared for Jesus' return itself. And Jesus says, my return is going to come like a thief in the night. Be prepared. Because you don't know when I'm coming, you need to always be prepared. And we have emphasize that point. But also it's important 
that we be prepared to stand against the waves of opposition and persecution when they come. Because we will face them as Christians. And we talked at length about that last week. In a world in which the spirit of Antichrist often raises its ugly head, Christians will face suffering. Christians will face opposition. Christians will face persecution. And so we need to be prepared for that as well. And that's been the subject of the three sermons from 1 Peter that I've entitled Bracing Ourselves. We can look around us, and we've talked about this, so I'm not going to say much about it, but we can see the indications around us in our culture and in our world of growing antagonism toward Christianity. And we recognize that if things don't change, we could well be called to suffer for our faith in Christ sooner rather than later. We have been incredibly blessed not to have been in that situation. And yet those days may well come for us. So how do we brace ourselves so that we're not knocked off our feet? I use the illustration of a big wave coming in and you have to stand there and get ready for it. You've got to brace yourself for it. So that we're not knocked off our feet when the day of evil comes. And that's why we've been looking at Peter's first letter, because it's written to Christians in Asia Minor who have been facing persecution and are already suffering for their faith in Christ. And the whole letter is about giving them advice and counsel. This is how you should stand. This is how you can stand in the day of evil. And so his counsel to them is relevant to us. And there's much more in this letter than we can adequately address in three sermons. Um, But we have looked at five things that Peter has said so far. He begins by reminding us of our hope and reminding us that we have a living hope. And so we don't need to be tossed about by the circumstances of the present because Our anchor is attached to God's promises and nothing can take those out of our hands because he has promised them to us. And so Peter says, because we have this hope, set your hope on that hope. Don't set your hope on the things of this world that come and go and the uncertainties that we cannot depend on. Set your hope on the hope that God has already given us in Christ. He also says, in view of our need to stand firm against opposition, we need to prepare our minds for action. We need to develop the habit of depending on God's word. We need to know his word and we need to depend upon his word for guidance and authority. He reminds us also that if we fear God, we don't need to be afraid of men. And so he says, in your hearts, set apart Christ. Devote yourselves to Christ. Make Christ holy in your hearts. And he also instructs the people that he's writing to that they need to be prepared for suffering. They need to get it in perspective and understand that suffering isn't wasted, but that God can use it to do great things in our lives. And those are the five things that we've looked at that Peter says uh, so far. And we're going to look at two more today. First one is how we should conduct ourselves toward those who oppose us because of our faith. How should we conduct ourselves toward them? And the second is, how should we conduct ourselves toward each other as fellow believers? 
So Peter refers to his readers in chapter 2 and verse 11, which is where we started our reading this morning. He refers to them as aliens and strangers in the world. And we have talked about that idea way back in the first sermon that I preached from, um, from this letter. And that idea of us being aliens and strangers in the world has a couple of implications. The first implication is we don't belong here, right? This world is not our home. We sojourn here, just as Abraham sojourned in the land of Canaan. But ultimately, we are looking for a better country that God has prepared for us, and that is our hope. And so we are strangers here. We don't belong here. The second implication of our being strangers is that we don't fit here either. To the world, we look odd and out of place. I mentioned last week that godliness can look evil in an upside-down world. So we will find that we are misfits, and that the world will often look on us with suspicion. Back in the early church, um, that was certainly the case. We have some writings from the time very close to when Peter was writing. Uh, One writer, Tacitus, who uh, was recording Nero's decision to Uh, persecute the Christians after the great fire of Rome, essentially said, you know what, we don't know if the Christians did anything or not, but they were a good scapegoat. And when the fire happened, Nero pegged it on them because they were an easy target because they were hated because of their abominations, Tacitus says. They were hated because of their abominations. And listen to what he says. He says, They were convicted not so much for the crime of setting the city on fire, but for the crime of hatred against mankind. Christians were convicted because they hated mankind, Tacitus says. And mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Another writer around that time, a governor, Pliny, who was writing to uh, the emperor hoping to get advice on how to deal with Christians, Um, and uh, um, he essentially describes them in the letter as being caught up by a depraved and excessive superstition. How do you feel about that? You are all part of a depraved and excessive superstition. But you've got to wonder, how is it that people can look at Christians and say that they hate mankind, when in fact the message of the gospel is about God's love for humanity? When you're right side up in an upside down world, you don't fit. You're out of place. So Peter addresses how we should conduct ourselves in the face of that kind of opposition and prejudice. And he says, live such good lives among the pagans, among those who don't believe, among those who are steeped in idolatry and who are upside down, live such good lives among them that though they accuse you of doing wrong, They will see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us or on the day when Christ returns. And if you think about it, you can hear the echo of Jesus' words, which Peter himself would have heard Jesus speak. When Jesus says in Matthew 5 and verse 16, Let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We are to be above reproach in our personal conduct and in our dealings with the world. 
even when people mock us or ridicule us or even condemn us as evil for our faith in Christ. Peter understands that when the world mistreats us, it's tempting to want to fight back. Any of you feel that? Do you ever get that bubbling up? We want to get all in their face and get angry and lash out and be vindicated, defend ourselves. But the fact is that that only gives them an excuse for their hatred. In chapter 4 and verse 15, Peter says, If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any kind of criminal. Well, that's good to know. How many of you have murdered someone recently? But notice what he says next. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. That hits a little closer to home. But if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. If we are offensive to the world, Peter says, Let it be because of Christ and the gospel and not because we're political bullies or moral police or whatever else. If we are offensive, let it be because of Christ. Instead, Peter instructs us, when when we are bullied because of Christ, we should respond with kindness and gentleness and respect. Because that, Peter says, will have a far greater impact on our adversaries than fighting back. In chapter 2 and verse 12, he says, if you do that, if you live rightly, Before them, even though they accuse you, they will see your good deeds and they will glorify God. And in chapter 3 and verse 16, he says, If you treat your opponents with gentleness and respect, those who speak maliciously against you will ultimately be ashamed. And that again. In what Peter says here, you can hear the echo of what Jesus taught that Peter himself would have heard from Jesus. When Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verses 38 through 42, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's the way the world runs, right? Justice. You hurt me, I hurt you. You say something bad about me, I'll get back on you. And Jesus says, no. I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. And Paul kind of brings the point home in Romans chapter 12 and verse 20, which is actually a quote from Proverbs, where he says, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. In other words, by your good behavior, expose their bad behavior. Don't give them a reason to justify their mistreatment of you. And when you take away the reason, they'll have nothing but their own conscience to contend with. It's not easy to forgo justice, is it? Any of you find that easy? But the gospel sets us free to turn the other cheek. It sets us free 
to turn the other cheek. Because we don't need to get justice in this world. And we don't need justice in this world. We don't need to get justice from men because we have already received mercy from the one who truly has the right to condemn us. And because we've received mercy from God, we no longer need justice from men. All is well. We are free to forgo justice. So Peter says, act in such a way that your good conduct sears the consciences of those who mistreat you. He also goes on to imply that our good conduct can also be a testimony to the people that mistreat us. And so he says in verse Three, chapter 3 and verse 15, be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. When you return hatred with kindness, when you face threats and persecution with confidence instead of fear, people are going to notice. So the way that we conduct ourselves when we're mistreated can actually provide opportunities to share the gospel because people will want to know what is it that makes us different what kind of hope do we have that enables us to forgo justice and forgive and how is it that we can face the threat of violence or perhaps even death without fear Peter says be prepared to give an answer I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about something that Paul said to the Philippians that really kind of embodies what Peter is talking about here, I think, and gives us a really good example of how we can be a witness for Christ by the way that we respond to mistreatment. Paul says to the Philippians in chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, he says, I want you to know that what has happened to me, which is now he is in prison in Rome, and actually he won't get out of prison probably. We don't know all the details of this particular imprisonment, but we do know that Paul was probably executed by Nero himself not long after writing this. But he says, I want you to know that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He's not worried about himself. He's glad the gospel is being advanced. How? Because he says, as a result of my imprisonment here in Rome, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And so Paul is looking at his imprisonment and he is saying, I traveled all around Asia Minor and all kinds of different places preaching the gospel. And here I am in chains, but that is not a problem. That's a blessing. Because now the gospel is known right at the center of the Roman Empire in, in, in Caesar's household itself. Because wherever he was, He was continuing to make the gospel known. During World War II, there was a priest in the Vatican named Monsignor Hugh O'Flaherty. Good Irish name. And uh, he is remembered for having helped over 6,500 Allied soldiers and Jews escape capture by the Nazis. And during that time, he was using the Vatican and uh, using his connections in Rome uh, to be able to do that. And because of that, he became the arch enemy of Herbert Kepler, who was the head of the Gestapo in Rome. And uh, After the war, it's interesting, here are these two men who are, who are seeking completely different objectives, and um, Kepler was doing everything that he could to stop O'Flaherty from what he was doing, and to get him, to put him in jail. 
Um, but after the war, Kepler actually came to O'Flaherty and asked him, will you get my family out? You have the connections to get people out. You've been doing it and driving me crazy all these years. Now I need you to help me. And O'Flaherty decided to do that. Not only did he decide to help Kepler, but when Kepler was convicted and sent to prison in um, solitary confinement for life, O'Flaherty visited him regularly. And 10 years later, the Irish priest led the Gestapo commander to Jesus Christ, and he was baptized. The story is uh, um, told in the movie The Scarlet and the Black. How many of you have seen that movie with Gregory Peck? And if you haven't, I encourage you to watch it. It's really good. Um, if our primary goal is not to seek justice for ourselves when we are mistreated, but to exalt Christ then how we conduct ourselves toward those who hate us can reap eternal rewards. All right. That's the first thing. You thought we were over. I'm sorry. We're getting close. The second thing that Peter talks about is not only how we conduct ourselves toward those who mistreat us, but also how should we conduct ourselves toward each other as fellow believers. In chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, as we read, he says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. And notice this, above all, love each other deeply. One of the greatest resources that we have as believers is our fellow believers. So it only makes sense that this is the place that Satan would want to attack us and seek to divide us in whatever ways that he can. In fact, if you remember back when we began this series, one of the things that Jesus warned his disciples about in Matthew 24 was that his followers would be inclined to turn against each other and even hate each other, and that that would be part of, that. those were things that they needed to guard against. Because Satan's goal is to isolate us so that we don't have each other for support and encouragement when the day of evil comes and when we need each other the most. I, uh, my wife actually um, came across an article recently by Tom Rainer. How many of you are familiar with Tom Rainer? Probably not very many of you. He has a ministry to churches and pastors, and he does a lot of research about what is happening in the church and where things are at and what pastors are thinking kind of keeps his finger on the pulse of the American church in order to provide feedback, to give counsel. He wrote an article recently, just a couple of weeks ago, entitled, Six Reasons Why Your Pastor is About to Quit. <laughs> this is what he says. <clears throat> Please hear me clearly. The vast majority of pastors with whom our team communicates are saying they are considering quitting their churches. It's a trend I have not seen in my lifetime. He goes on to list the six reasons, and one of those reasons is this. He says, pastors are greatly discouraged about the fighting taking place among church members about the post-quarantine church. Gather in person or wait. Masks or no masks. Social distancing or not. Too many church members have made these issues political fights and are quick 
to condemn each other for the stand that they're taking. I want to assure you I'm not considering leaving, though by the time I'm done, you might wish I was. <clears throat> but in some strange way, it is nice to know that I'm not alone in my discouragement at the divisiveness that I see over this issue. On the one side are those who have difficulty with the executive orders that have been handed down, and they have difficulty complying with the mandates that we've been given. And they are accused of being selfish and heartless and unconcerned with the health of people around them. On the other hand are those who think it's important to listen to the advice of those that have made it their life's work to study infectious disease and to do our best to follow the guidelines that they've given us. And those people are accused of being fearful and not trusting God and being naive about the more sinister agenda behind the COVID crisis. And I've heard it from both sides. I've done my best to listen to those that represent both sides. And what I find is that though they're inclined to judge and condemn each other, people on both sides have legitimate concerns. For the people that are resistant to the mandates, it's not a matter of putting their personal rights above the health and welfare of others. That's not what they're doing. They're concerned that under the auspices of the pandemic, a fresh attack has been launched on freedom in general. They aren't standing selfishly for their personal rights. They're trying to figure out how to preserve the principles that our nation was built on. Because if our society turns its back on those principles, it will have grave repercussions not only for our nation, but for the cause of biblical values in the world and for the cause of human rights in the world. On the other side are those who are being careful with regard to the guidance that we've received. And though they're accused of being fearful and not trusting God, I find that they are not fearful at all. They're simply far more concerned with the welfare of others than they are fearful for themselves. And they're willing to sacrifice their own convenience and comfort if it will help to protect others. They're looking at the information that we have available to us and they have concluded that there is a real threat to public health, especially to the vulnerable. So they're doing their best to live out their faith by obeying those who have been placed in authority over us, regardless of whether they agree or disagree with every directive that we've received. So those are the two sides. Let me settle this dispute once for all and tell you all what you should think. The fact is, I don't think any of us has enough information at this point to know. And I won't be surprised if we look back at, the, at all of this, and when we do, we'll see that both sides were right about some things and wrong about others. It's usually the way it goes. But what concerns me more than who is right or wrong is the anger and the judgmentalism that I see that looks more like the world than the church. The problem is not that people disagree. Disagreement itself is not an indication of a lack of love. I find myself disagreeing most often with the people I love the most. Do you find that to be true? Paul and Barnabas disagreed to the point that they no longer recognized they could no longer do ministry together. And we have been through a similar painful situation, separation in our own life as a body. Disagreement is a natural consequence of our limited perspective. We don't see everything the way God does, and so we're going to draw different conclusions. It, it is natural. 
So it's not that we disagree, but that the call to love each other doesn't go out the window when we disagree. And my concern, and the concern of many other pastors, is with the tone of the current disagreement. There's a lot of anger and contempt toward those with whom we disagree. One of the things that I see happening is people labeling each other, and I hear the, that label, so-and-so's a liberal. They don't wear a face mask, or they wear a face mask. They must be a liberal. Or so-and-so is right-wing because you're not liberal enough. And often those labels are bandied about without any true knowledge of what that person really thinks. And that's the problem with imposing those kinds of labels on each other. Because it gives us a reason to dismiss people. And then we don't have to take them seriously because we've labeled them and put them over there in that category and now we're done with them. We don't need to listen. We don't need to try to understand where they're coming from or what they really think. That's the way the world does things. But Peter's call is that we love each other deeply and treat others with gentleness and respect. And that call doesn't end when we disagree. Rather, it becomes all that much more important. If we treat each other with contempt in our disagreements and despise those with whom we don't see eye to eye, how are we different from the world? Jesus said, you, you love your friends, great. Big deal, right? What does it say about the importance of Christ to us, who died to make us one? The fact is that through the ages, God's people have had to try to understand what living as a Christian in the midst of a, the culture around them, what that should look like. What does it mean to live like a Christian in this time, in this place, with these things that are happening? Not everyone is going to agree about that. And historically, Christians have disagreed about that. And the tension of crisis, like the crisis we're in right now, the tension of crisis often brings those disagreements to the forefront. They bubble to the top when we're under stress. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, during World War II, struggled between this tension of these are my Christian principles, and yet I've been invited to join a group whose goal it is to murder Hitler. What should I do? And he wrestled with that tension. And good people drew different conclusions about that. In the end, Bonhoeffer joined that group, and he ended up being executed himself because of it. There's a great story in uh, Corrie ten Boom's <clears throat> book, The Hiding Place, about her and her sister Betsy having an argument. And you may remember it if you've read the book. The Nazis are on their way down the street and they have figured out a way. They've cut a hole in their dining room floor so that they could hide their nephew from the Nazis. Because if the Nazis find him, they're gonna conscript him into the army and it probably means death for him. So they've cut a hole in their dining room floor. They put a rug over it, put the table on top, and that's where they hid him. So the Nazis are coming down the street. The nephew goes in the hole. All of a sudden, Betsy and Corey start to argue. Because Betsy is convinced that if the Nazis ask them, they need to tell the truth. That's what Christian principle would demand of them. And Corey is equally adamant that no, we don't have to worry about telling the truth to murderers. And so they have this discussion. And the police are coming down the street, and finally they arrive at their home, and they ask, are you harboring anyone here? And Betsy says, yes. He's under the table. 
And the Nazis look under the table, nothing there, think she's being facetious, and they go away. <clears throat> During the Reformation, many sincere believers were advocating for reform from within, reform of the church from within. And there were others that were convinced that the only way forward was to part ways with the Catholic Church. And even in Jesus' own disciples, there was at least one zealot who was a freedom fighter who hated the Romans and believed that any good Jew should rise up and take arms against them. And there was another who was a collaborator collecting taxes for the Romans, and yet Jesus called them both to be his disciples. He didn't choose people who agreed or who were all the same. He purposefully chose people who were very different from each other. Who could be more different than a tax collector and a zealot? Who could be more different than Jews and Gentiles? But he chose people who were different so that through them, he could demonstrate the supernatural power of the cross to transform lives and to turn enemies into brothers and sisters. I don't expect that the disagreement over these things will suddenly disappear. Do you? <clears throat> I might disappear but uh, the disagreement may not. I'm not going anywhere, but someone may have it out for me now. But I do pray that the name-calling and the accusations and the bickering will end. We need each other too much, and the world needs to see what Christian love looks like. If and when the day of evil comes, may we not be found in disarray, bickering amongst ourselves. May we be prepared to stand firm, conducting ourselves in such a way that even those who oppose us will see our good works and glorify God. And may God empower us by his spirit to love each other deeply with his kind of love so that the world will know that the power of the resurrection is real because they see it at work in us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, these have been hard things. Hard things to say and hard things to hear. And Lord, I thank you that you don't deal with us. You don't throw us into categories. You deal with us each individually. And Lord, I pray that the words that I have spoken today, that I believe you have given to me, I pray that every one of us would Seek to hear what you would say to us. That you would deal with each of us individually. And Lord, our desire is that we would be a witness and a testimony to the power of the cross. To the power of the resurrection. That the world would know that you are God. And that the offer of salvation that you offer to us is genuine and real. That you have the power to lift us up above the mess. Father, may that be our desire to make that known and to live that above all other things. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.
Grace and peace to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Go in the grace and peace and unity of our Lord Jesus Christ. An usher is going to come and dismiss you uh, by your rows and um, encourage you to make your way to Pastor Brian's backyard for some time of fellowship. God bless you as you go.